ever start a new job, one with some serious responsibility, and they just kind of throw a stack of manuals at you like, good luck, you know? Yeah. It's uh, sadly more common than you'd think. Companies treat training like an afterthought. Yeah, exactly. And then we wonder why everyone feels like they're just figuring things out as they go along, which, yeah. you know, not ideal when the stakes are high. What if there was a better way? Well, today we're diving into a method called structured social learning. Think on the job training, but like done right. We've got some research lined up on this. And while well, you know me, I love a good system. So I'm really curious to see what we'd uncover. It's definitely more than just throwing someone in the deep end and hoping for the best. It's about recognizing that, yeah, learning by doing is great, but it's the guidance, the effective guidance that really makes it stick. Okay, so how is this structured social learning different from just, you know, showing someone the ropes? So structured social learning, it's all about transferring the exact knowledge and skills someone needs to be competent. And it does this by guiding them through the actual work. It's the structured part that's key here. Actually, the level of structure, ideally, it should match how critical the task is. So, like, if I'm baking cookies with my niece, I probably don't need a detailed flowchart. But, you know, if I'm teaching someone to fly a plane, that's different. Exactly, yeah. In fact, one of the sources we're looking at today talks about how Exxon faced this exact problem. Back in the 80s, their seasoned oil exploration experts, they were about to retire, like, en masse, and they had to get all these new recruits up to speed and fast. Turns out, their existing training, it was all over the place. It took almost 10 years for someone to become fully proficient. 10 years? That's that's longer than some PhD programs. What was going wrong? It all came down to being too unstructured. What worked in one location or with one mentor, it might not translate somewhere else. Exxon realized they needed a standardized system, something replicable, something reliable, you know, something right. to really capture that expert knowledge. So they needed like a shortcut. But not just some, you know, crash course. It had to be something that could reliably transmit years worth of expert knowledge. How they do that? Well, that's where structured social learning comes in. Instead of just like shadowing someone, this method actually has a framework for building what they call structured social learning guides. Our sources describe it as a seven level system for transferring those really critical skills. Seven levels, huh? That, that does sound structured. We probably don't have time to like unpack all seven of them. But what are some of the, you know, most important levels? Well, it all starts with like the end in mind, right? Okay. So level one, it's all about outputs. What's the tangible, measurable outcome, you know, we're aiming for? Makes sense. Got to know what done looks like before you can <laughs> figure out how to get there. Exactly. And that leads directly into level two, which is stakeholder measures and standards. So who's deciding if that output is actually good? What are the criteria they're using? It's kind of like um, baking a cake. Like, it needs to be technically sound, sure, but it also has to satisfy, you know, the client's vision. Ooh, I like that analogy. It's about meeting those real-world expectations, not just checking boxes on a list. But it's more than just the what in this case, right? We're talking about, like, replicating expertise. You've hit on a really crucial point. Level three, that's where it gets even more interesting. This level, it's all about the cognitive tasks, the why behind the expert's actions, capturing those often unspoken insights that, you know, true expertise is built on. Yeah, those aha moments we all want, right? It's the difference between just mimicking steps and actually understanding the logic. How do you even go about figuring out what's going on in an expert's head? It takes um, careful observation and a lot of questions. You watch the expert in action, ask them to like break down their decisions, and you really try to uncover that why behind each choice, almost like you're reverse engineering their expertise. Okay, so we've got our desired outcome, the measures of success, and now we've got the why behind the how. What comes next? Level six, that's all about performance tests. And we're not talking about like multiple choice here. This is about testing those skills in a realistic environment, often through like simulations or something called talk through troubleshooting. Talk through troubleshooting. Okay, now I'm really intrigued. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so one of our sources uses the example of uh, training technicians who work on the Alaska pipeline. The stakes are incredibly high, right? Yeah. Imagine the pressure of potentially making a mistake that impacts something so critical. Yeah, I don't think trial and error is really an option when it comes to a pipeline. Exactly. So instead of letting trainees you know, practice on the actual pipeline, they use this talk through troubleshooting. So the expert, they'll present a realistic scenario, like say a system malfunction. And then they guide the learner by asking questions like, what would you do first? What readings would you look at? What tools would you use? 
and the learner has to you know explain their reasoning every step of the way. So it's like high stakes, choose your own adventure, but you have to justify every decision you make to the expert. Precisely. It forces them to apply their knowledge, anticipate potential problems, and really explain their thought process and all of that, you know, in a safe environment. That's uh, that's incredible, like a flight simulator, but for critical thinking. You get to practice those high stakes decisions without, you know, the real world consequences. But this all sounds, I don't know, pretty labor intensive. How do you actually implement something like this in an organization, especially with, you know, things constantly changing? Yeah, you're right. It's not like a one and done kind of thing to really make structured social learning work. Our sources emphasize that you need a system in place, a system for both, you know, implementing it and maintaining it. Okay, so walk me through this. What does that system actually look like? Well, first off, we have to remember everyone's coming in with a different level of experience, right? Uh -huh. Individual development planning is like super key here. Basically, it means tailoring the training to the individual's specific role their current skills, and, you know, even what they want to achieve. So it's not like a one-size-fits-all approach. Exactly. And these plans, these individual plans, they need to be reviewed pretty regularly, like at least annually. That way you can make sure the training is staying relevant as, you know, as the person in the job evolves. That makes sense for keeping the learning, I guess, on track for each person. But how do you make sure the training itself stays up to date? Like what happens when, you know, some new tech gets introduced or processes change? That's a great question. That's where the performance competency functional councils come in. They're basically like the guardians of good training. Okay, before we dive deeper into that, can you tell me a little bit more about what these councils actually like do? Absolutely. So these councils, they're responsible for defining what good actually looks like, you know, for a specific job. They make sure the training materials actually reflect those standards mm -hmm. and that they're up to date. It's like they're constantly doing like quality control on the training process. Ah, okay, that makes a lot more sense. So they're the ones ensuring the training doesn't become like obsolete. How do they how do they actually do that? It's an ongoing process. These councils are always gathering feedback and they get it from, you know, from the people actually using the system. So that's the learners, the coaches, the managers, you know, everyone. And then they use all that feedback to make updates, improvements. They're basically hardwiring change management into the whole system. Wow, this has been uh, this has been eye opening. It's so much more than just like showing someone the ropes. It's about building a whole culture of like continuous learning and improvement. And it gets results. Remember Exxon from before by implementing structured social learning. They were able to cut the time it took to train those new explorationists by more than half from 10 years down to five. That's that's incredible. It really makes you wonder why this isn't the standard, you know, everywhere. Yeah, you're not wrong. I think a lot of organizations, they let that upfront investment, you know, scare them off. But as we've seen, the payoff can be huge, both in terms of faster learning and improved performance. This really makes me think about all the other areas where, you know, where this approach could be applied. Imagine if we use something like this in, I don't know, in schools or even for things like learning a new language or a musical instrument. It could totally transform how we approach skill development in like so many aspects of life. It's a powerful model, that's for sure. You know, next time you're struggling to learn something new or maybe like dreading the onboarding process at a new job, think about structured social learning. There might be a more engaging, more effective way to approach that whole learning process. Yeah.